for a matter of disclosure, I disassociate myself with the millennial <laughs> remarks. <laughs> well, thank you all uh, very much uh, for being here this evening. Uh, this is a very special occasion for the Bipartisan Policy Centers. We're launching our second annual Legislative Action Award. And it's all the more special uh, for me because I have the opportunity to introduce and present the award uh, to my successor in the United States Senate, a truly outstanding uh, senator from Maine and America, my great friend, uh, Senator Angus King. Uh, before I begin, I also uh, want to congratulate as well uh, Senator Cory Gardner, who's a friend and neighbor, uh, for being a bipartisan champion as well in the United States Senate and to the other awardees, uh, Representative Ruiz and Representative Brooks. I have known Angus uh, for many years. I'm just not going to tell you how many. Uh, <laughs> but I knew Angus uh, even before he succeeded my husband, uh, Jack McKernan, as Maine's governor, when Angus hosted a television program on Maine Public Broadcasting where he probed the timely issues of the day. And he unfailingly uh, demonstrated that uh, the institutions of journalism as well as public service uh, that are vital to our democracy are indeed noble endeavors. I have to say I was always impressed uh, that Angus, having been around so many politicians on his show, uh, that he still decided to run uh, for public office. <laughs> but we are enormously grateful for that, Angus. As Jason has described uh, the award, uh, it is to honor those who serve as a template for how the legislative process works, particularly in this time of uh, political gridlock and dysfunction. You know, in the United States Senate, uh, it is designed specifically uh, by our founding fathers uh, to be uh, a refuge from the passion of politics where the political fires are to be tempered, not stoked. Uh, a place for distilling uh, the vast array of opinions and ideologies in America in order to forge solutions to address our nation's most urgent problems. That's why it is so essential that we celebrate those like Senator Angus King, who value compromise and consensus building as indispensable to functioning government, making government work, uh, because that's essentially the spirit and the essence of public service. You know, I always say that um, there are only 100 members of the United States Senate, and every voice and every vote matters, because every senator not only represents their state, they represent the country. And that's why we're so fortunate uh, to have Senator King, who continues uh, the legacy that I and Senator Collins, who's a bipartisan leader in the Senate as well, uh, inherited in the legacy from legislative giants uh, who represented Maine, uh, Senators Margaret Chase Smith, Ed Muskie, uh, former Senate Majority Leader George Mitchell, who is also the co-founder of the Bipartisan Policy Center, as well as Bill Cohen. These were examples uh, that we followed in the tradition of being independent and doing what Maine people expected us to do to believe in what we were doing, but doing it in the right way and for the right reasons. And Senator King, throughout his tenure in the United States Senate, has not disappointed. In fact, he's been an exemplar of that legacy. He is serious, he's committed, he's effective, and he's a principal lawmaker who, as an independent, has caucused uh, with the Democrats, and yet ranks in the top echelons of the Senate in the Luger Center's Index for Bipartisanship. And most recently, um, as a member of the Senate Common Sense Coalition, he and Senator Rounds have introduced a bipartisan measure to protect the Dreamers, as well as strengthening America's uh, borders. It's a proposal that actually proves that ultimate, ultimately tough political trade-offs can result in smart policies. He was integral, as well as part of the coalition, to reopen government during the shutdown that occurred this year, as well as the one that occurred uh, in 2013. He's teamed up with Senator Hatch on legislation to expand financing opportunities for small businesses, families, and entrepreneurs. He's joined uh, Senator Rubio, Senator Burr, Senator Collins, and Lamar Alexander uh, in introducing legislation 
uh, that restructures the federal student loan repayment program. He's also, as a key member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, has partnered with Senator Jim Risch uh, to introduce legislation to protect our nation's energy grid from cyber attacks. Uh, he has been a voice of reason on an array of key issues, whether it's national defense or national security or domestic issues. And believe me, I think as we all well know, we meet, need more voices of reasons in the United States Senate and in the overall United States Congress. So for this and more, uh, Senator King embodies the spirit of our award because he places above all else the best interests of this country. So Angus, uh, for your stellar contributions. <laughs> For your stellar contributions, I would like to present to you uh, this award uh, for your willingness uh, to transcend partisanship, uh, your courage and vision to bridge the political divide, and for all that you have done to enhance the norms and traditions of the United States Senate. So congratulations. Well, it's my honor to Thank present so this much. to you. Thank, Thank you. you. So I love succeeding Olympia. <laughs> uh, Isabella, where are you? Where's Isabella? Come on up here. <laughs> Your dad said you were here unexcused. Come here. I've written a note. Please excuse Isabella today. She was helping me to run the country. <laughs> I don't want anybody getting in trouble on my behalf. Um, well, you have, you have no idea what this means to me. Uh, first, to be presented this award by uh, one of my heroes, uh, Olympia Snow. I, she, ha she and I go back to when uh, she was a state senator in Maine and one of the most effective uh, members of the state senate. Then she was in the House uh, and then, of course, uh, in the Senate. And periodically, and this is true, I've never said this to you before, Olympia, periodically, uh, after I was governor, people would say, well, have you ever thought about running for the Senate? And my answer always was, why should I? We have two great senators. There's no real reason, uh, you know, ideologically or anything else, it would be a pure uh, uh, personal something or other, and so it never crossed my mind. And I, I literally gave that answer. That was the, that was the standard answer. And then when Olympia decided not to run in uh, almost exactly six years ago this week, uh, uh, I decided that I would uh, give it a try. And uh, what the reason this means so much to me is it captures exactly why I did it. Uh, it's really nice when somebody notices that what you're trying to do uh, because the whole, my whole mission is to try to make this place work. Uh, and it is hard. Uh, it is hard in this atmosphere, and, and I was talking with some people the other day. They were asking, why is the Congress and the Senate so polarized? And the answer is because the country is polarized. Uh, and there, uh, there are a multiplicity of answers, but, but really one of the answers is that we have such a hard time in this country getting to consensus because the, the citizens who elect the representatives are also polarized, and there are these strong uh, views one way or the other. And all of you are thoughtful people that are interested in public policy, and I will share with you what I think one of the principal problems is. I'm afraid I don't have an answer. I hate identifying problems without an answer. But I think one of the problems in this country is that we don't share the facts. When I was a kid, we all got our facts from one person. Who was it? Isn't it amazing everybody gave the same answer? Walter Cronkite. And now, of course, we get our facts and our information from so many different sources. And I learned a new term a couple of years ago that I think really applies. It's called confirmation bias. And confirmation bias is the human natural tendency to seek out information sources that agree with where we already are. So if you're conservative, you watch Fox News, and if you're liberal, you watch MSNBC. If you can't make up your mind, you listen to NPR. <laughs> but, but seriously, 
if you can't, if we can't establish a common understanding of the facts, whether it's of immigration or guns or budgets, it's almost impossible to reach a, a solution. On the other hand, it's been my experience, once you get everyone around the table and all the facts are out, the solution, the policy becomes almost self-evident. So that's one of the struggles that we have. There's a second struggle that, that we have that I think makes our work so difficult. And I thought about this because I worked here uh, 44 years ago, 45 years ago. In the early 70s, I was a staff member in the U.S. Senate uh, on the Committee on Labor and Public Welfare. And I've tr tried to think about what's different today from what it was then, because that was one of the great Senates. The committee I worked for had Jacob Javits and Bill Hathaway and Walter Mondale and Bob Taft and Ted Kennedy. I mean, this was a really amazing group of people. Uh, I will digress and tell you one story. Uh, in the midst of one of our markups, uh, one of the staff members came in from the Nandy room and said, uh, I hate to interrupt the meeting, but they just interrupted the Mets game, the Mets playoff game, to announce that Vice President Agnew has resigned. Dead silence. Nobody knew what to say. Until about 20 seconds later, Walter Mondale said, what was the score in the game? <laughs> it was one of the funniest moments of my life. But I worked for the committee then, and the, and the Senate worked then. And I, I've asked myself, what's changed? And here's an interesting thing that's changed. And if you want to talk about the Bipartisan Policy Center and how we might be able to fix some of our politics, the difference is, in 1975, everybody lived here. And the Senate schedule was Monday to Friday. And today, the Senate schedule is, as Corey knows, the first, the first vote is Monday afternoon at 5, and the last vote is Thursday afternoon at 1 or 2, and everybody goes home. And so there are literally no, or very few, in the way of social relationships where people can get to know each other and build relationships of trust and confidence, which is how you make difficult decisions. You can't make an, an agreement on a difficult decision with someone you don't trust or who you don't know. And so this is, I believe, uh, it's, it's, a, it's funny that a mechanical thing like the schedule would change. My wife, Mary, is in Maine. I think, isn't your family in Colorado, Corey? His, Corey's family's in Colorado. Brian Schatz, the senator from Hawaii, goes home every weekend. Wyoming, Colorado, Ohio, Oregon, you know, Florida. And the result is that we very rarely have any time together other than the intense cauldron of committee meetings and, and floor votes during those really three, three days plus a few hours. I have my own little project on this. Mary and I bought a small house on Capitol Hill, 908 square feet. I say that because one of the local political newspapers said it was 9,080 square feet. <laughs> which I really had to correct before it got back to Maine. Uh, but two blocks from our house is Kenny's Smokehouse. So about once every six weeks, my office calls around to a random group of senators, always bipartisan, and says, you want to have dinner with, with Angus on uh, Tuesday or Wednesday night, whatever it is. I call Kenny's, two racks of ribs, coleslaw, beans, and mild on the side. Pick That is the catering, you see. I pick that up on the way, and we have dinner. And I've had now, I think, about 50 or so senators, everybody from Elizabeth Warren and Chuck Schumer to Ted Cruz and John Cornyn, just to pick a random <laughs> group. But here's, here's the point. At one of these dinners, two of the senators were sitting there chatting, and one turned to me and said, you know, I've seen this guy around here for eight years, and this is the first time we've ever talked. Now, think about that for a minute. How can you possibly expect us to solve immigration or, or, you know, the budget or any of these difficult issues when people literally haven't talked? So I think that's something that we need. If I was in charge, through some oversight, I'm not, but if I were in charge, I would say let's, we, let's work Monday to Friday just like everybody else and go home every fifth week to, to our district 
and and you know it would I think it would really change the way this place operates. In the meantime, I'm going to keep having my dinners, and Corey and I'll keep hanging out when we can together and, and chatting. But it is, it is a uh, it, it is a problem, and and I guess finally I I want to say. My wife Mary says I say finally too much. It gets people's hopes up. Uh, <laughs> I want to say how much this center has meant to, to me and, and my office. Uh, uh, this, the, the, the staff, the people of this center uh, were instrumental in helping us to forge the compromise on immigration that came this close. Uh, and if it hadn't been uh, for the work of this group, I don't think we could have gotten there. They've worked with us on the budget. Uh, work with us on school funding. Uh, it, it, you, it, it has really been, uh, I just want, if there are any board members here of, of the Bipartisan Policy Center, your people are doing good. Uh, you're doing exactly what I think this was established to do, and that is to help us with the facts, the data, the background, the policy arguments on both sides to find solutions. And every now and then it happens. Uh, we're about to pass a banking bill. That was a heavily negotiated compromise. It has 15 or 16 or 17 Democratic sponsors, myself, and uh, a, lot, a lot of Republican sponsors. It's probably going to pass. Um, it's getting flack from both sides, which tells me that maybe it's, we're in the right territory. You don't get flack unless you're above the target, is my motto. And that's an example of a complex, difficult issue that is being worked out on a bipartisan basis, and that should be the model going forward. I can tell you there are a lot of people in the Senate, and Cory Gardner is certainly one of them, who want to make this place work. And I'm just delighted. I mean, I, it, it, this means so much to me because it's just what I hope to do. And I want to thank uh, the, the staff and the board of the center uh, not only for the award, but more importantly, for the work that you're doing to help our country uh, find its way through uh, this difficult time. So uh, thank you. I can't tell you how much this means, uh, and especially uh, to get it from, uh, have, have it presented by uh, someone who I've looked up to for all of my uh, uh, professional and adult life uh, who did such great service to the state of Maine. Uh, and for the people of this country. So I'm going to accept this. Now, had this award been given 10, 12 years ago, Olympia Snow would be getting it. So that's why it means so much to me. Thank you all so much. <laughs>